Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Fress, host of the program Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And Walt has asked me to come and do a series of audios on dispensational futurism, and I have entitled it The Diabolical Jesuit Foundations of the New World Order. It is a discovery that futurism, dispensational futurism, as as is taught in the churches today, is a Jesuit-manufactured lie for the purpose of destroying Protestantism in, in conformity to the Jesuit oath. They are sworn to destroy Protestantism, and this is the mechanism by which they do destroy Protestantism. They have reversed the Protestant knowledge that the papacy is, was, and always will be the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible, and have put forward the proposition by twisting the identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, They have changed the identity from Christ to Antichrist so as to exonerate the papacy of the Protestant onus of Antichrist and to place it on a single individual at the end of time, thus overthrowing the Protestant Reformation and making the Protestant Reformation look like a vicious attack against the vicar of Christ, the papacy simply by convincing the Christians of the world and throughout the last three generations that the Pope is not the Antichrist, as the Protestant Reformers all unanimously believed and taught, that he is not the Antichrist, but one individual that comes upon the world scene within the last seven years before Christ's return. And that in itself destroys the Protestant Reformation. Now, yesterday we were talking about the mechanism by which this dispensational futurism got injected into Protestant belief and teaching. And we were talking about meetings held by Christian leaders back in the late 1700s and early 1800s, whereby the the proposition was put forward that the Pope is not the Antichrist, that the Scripture according to Daniel 9.27, says it's going to be a future antichrist, a future antichrist, exonerating the papacy. And in order to make that futurist interpretation of Daniel 9.27 more believable and more tasteful, they frosted it with this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture that even though Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time, even before his debut onto the world scene, the rapture will take place, and thus all Bible-believing Christians will be raptured up into heaven and not suffer the persecution. This is quite contrary to the teachings of Christ and the apostles. It's a Jesuit fabricated lie to get Protestants to stop studying Bible prophecy. I mean, why expend the effort, the time, and the trauma of studying Bible prophecy when none of it's going to matter since we're all going to be raptured out and and, and taken into heaven before Antichrist even comes upon the scene? This ensures that Bible believers, Bible studiers, Bible prophets, prophecy students never discover through studying the Scripture and coming to the realization that the Protestant Reformers all unanimously held that the Antichrist is the papacy, always was, is, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. Look, it's simple as this. If you believe in a future Antichrist, you cannot believe the Pope is the Antichrist. That's just how easy the Jesuits have destroyed Protestantism. And it was simply by changing the identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. While that prophecy speaks of none other than Jesus Christ, the Jesuits have convinced the Christian world that this is a reference to a future Antichrist, and all of that for the purpose of putting forward a false Christ. Just as 
the misunderstanding of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, through that misunderstanding, the Jews knew not the time of their visitation. And likewise, in our day, because we have been lied to about that, that very self-same prophecy, the Bible believers of today will not know the time of their visitation because Christ won't come until after this phony Antichrist arise, arises in the world and after the false Christ is presented to the world. Only then will Christ return. That's my belief. I believe the Scripture uh, br- uh, brings this out. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus said to the Jews, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there is one who is coming after me who will come in his own name, and him you will receive. The Jews are going to receive him, and all the Protestants today who believe that the Jews will be saved by making animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple in a modern nation state of Israel created by the Vatican, that they too will be deceived by this false antichrist, this false Christ. But God's people hold to the Protestant Reformation, the, the correct belief in historicism that the papacy fulfills all of this. Now, <clears throat> we were talking about the 1830s when a woman in the uh, Presbyterian Church led by Edward Irving made an ecstatic utterance known as tongues, a message that seemed to indicate that God's people would be raptured out before the appearance of Antichrist. It says Edward Irving was disposed from the ministry and died in 1834, but not before his, tri- his pre-tribulationism had been introduced at the power court meetings. Now, the power court meetings were held in the castle. Okay, All the big wigs of England were there. This is where dispensation, Jesuit-derived dispensational futurism really got a shot in the arm. And Edward Irving lived to see its success before he died. He promoted pre-tribulationism. Now, what does pre-tribulation espouse? It says that God's people will be raptured out before the tribulation. Okay? But the Bible says all of God's people, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. This is dispensational futurism, as presented by Jesuit priest Ribera and Lacunza. Now, after the power court meetings, it says, Dr. Tregalis tells us, quote, I'm not aware that there was a definite teaching that there would be a secret rapture of the church at a secret coming of Jesus Christ until this was given forth as an utterance in Mr. Irving's church from what was there received as being the voice of the Spirit. But what the brilliant, though tragically misguided Irving regarded as the voice of the Spirit was nothing more than the Spirit of the Jesuit which he himself so lately aroused. That is Jesuit priest Lacunza and Jesuit priest Ribera. The two-stage coming of, of Jesus Christ. It's a Jesuit hoax, and it has marvelously succeeded in destroying true Bible Protestantism in the world today. He says, indeed, this this entire congregation was later to defect to the Church of Rome. Now, why would these Protestants, these Presbyterians led by Edward Irving, why would they defect from Protestantism and then join the Church of Rome? For the reasons that I just described. If Antichrist doesn't come until the future, then it can't be the papacy throughout history. The Protestant reformers had to be wrong. Their claim that the papacy was, is, and always will be the Antichrist must be wrong. And that means that the Protestant Reformation, which overthrew both the spiritual and the temporal power of the Pope throughout all of the world, and nearly destroyed the papacy, nearly destroyed the Roman Catholic Church since everyone abandoned the Pope, 
as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, that that was the gravest assault against the true throne of God on earth since Christianity began. So these Irvingites, believing in a future Antichrist, repudiated the Protestant Reformation and as a means of repentance of the Protestant Reformation became card-carrying Roman Catholics. They joined the Roman Catholic Church, lock, stock, and barrel. And I've just described to you what motivates the ecumenical reuniting of all the Protestant churches in our generation under papal authority after Vatican Council II. Vatican Council II was just a formal act of surrender by the Protestants. They have repudiated the Protestant Reformation, and they seek peace and unity with the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. They have repudiated the the belief, the historical belief that the papacy is the Antichrist, and have accepted a single man at the end of time as the Antichrist, and they have exonerated the papacy. And not only are they reuniting with the Roman Catholic Church, but they are making reparations to the papacy. You see, the Protestant Reformation destroyed all the power of the the Pope in the world, stripped him of his wealth, his power, and his influence. He could no longer control the kings of the earth. He could no longer persecute the saints. And it cost the Vatican a tremendous amount of money in indulgences and masses for the dead and all the other money-making techniques that the Vatican uses. And so... The Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican in particular, says, now that you've signed the documents of capitulation at Vatican Council II, I demand what I am owed. That is full restoration of my spiritual and temporal power and all the riches that you've deprived me of because of your apostasy in the Protestant Reformation. And that's the business of the United States today, now to make reparations to the Vatican. And this is why you're seeing the... The, the global redistribution of the world's wealth. This wealthy, God-blessed Protestant nation has now repudiated Christ, repudiated the Protestant Reformation, and the papacy is taking the, 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 the wealth of this nation and distributing it to non-Protestant nations. This is the result of Vatican Council II. This is the result of dispensational futurism. This is the result of repudiating Bible-believing Protestantism in favor of a Jesuit lie, dispensational futurism. Now, the author continues, he says, Meanwhile, the young John Nelson Darby, we've all heard of him, John Nelson Darby, a former Church of Ireland clergyman and an extreme Anglo-Catholic, That means he was a member of the Roman Catholic Church, an extreme member of the English Roman Catholic Church, had not remained unaffected by what was happening. You know, you might imagine that any Roman Catholic who says the papacy has been exonerated, the papacy is not, as the Protestant reformer said, the historical, biblical, and prophetic Antichrist, but it's one single man that comes at the end of time. Certainly, an extreme Anglo-Catholic would be very interested in those types of stirrings, especially among Protestant churches, would he not? Now he says, John Nelson Darby, a former Church of Ireland clergyman and an extreme Anglo-Catholic, had not remained unaffected by what was happening. At the famous prophetic uh, conferences, first at Albury Park in Dublin in 1825, then Power Court House in 1829, Darby met up with the leaders of the Brethren Movement, another so-called Protestant organization, the Irvingites, de Berg, and others who had been influenced by Ben Ezra's book, Jesuit priest Ben Ezra's book, the coming prince, uh, the coming Messiah in glory and majesty. Okay, this is put, putting forward this future uh, Messiah, rejecting Jesus as the Messiah that came 2,000 years ago. 
Now it says, John Nelson Darby emerged as a powerful expositor and author on prophetic matters. The conferences were unanimous in the, expe- the expectation of a future Antichrist. So here, with all of this publicity, by the power court meetings and other high-level meetings among quote-unquote Christianity, with the help of John Nelson Darby, everyone now believes that the orthodox teaching of Christianity is the, that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time. Okay, that's become the orthodox teaching of, dare I say it, Protestantism. And anyone who holds to the original Protestant belief that the Pope was, is, and always will be the Antichrist is now regarded as heterodox or heretic teaching. Woe, woe, woe to them who believe in futurism. Woe, woe, woe to them who have rejected Protestantism. Now it says these conferences were unanimous in the expectation of a future Antichrist. John Nelson Darby, whose course had taken an evangelical turn, here we have a Roman Catholic, an extreme English Roman Catholic, now pretending to be Protestant, was later to succeed in fusing the diverse elements of the new futurism into a scheme of his own, which he liked to call dispensational truth. Okay? Now, what does dispensational truth imply? Simply this, that God deals with humanity in dispensations, distinct periods of time where he deals specifically with first Israel, then the Gentiles, and the Jews again at the end of time. But dispensational truth indicates that there is a different means of salvation for the Christ-rejecting Jews as there is for all other believers. It defies the scriptural teaching that says, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It proposes that there will be an exception for the Jews that they don't have to believe in Jesus Christ, though they rejected him 2,000 years ago and by and large still reject him, and that somehow God will find a way to achieve their salvation through the readministration, the reinstitution of Temple Mount worship in Jerusalem, and that by animal sacrifices, by the blood of lambs and goats, that God will accept that too, as a propitiation for the sins of the Jews, and that they will be saved by once again returning to Temple Mount worship. That is not what the Scripture says. Any other sacrifice is an abomination to the Lord. It is an abject rejection of the blood that Jesus shed for us all. The animal sacrificial system of Israel was to point to Christ, and that once Christ came, it replaced the animals. He replaced the animal sacrificial system and put it to an end, never to be repeated again. But dispensational truth by John Nelson Darby deceives God's people into believing there's a different means of salvation for the Christ-rejecting Jews as there, wa- there is for everyone else in the world. Is God a respecter of persons? Would God repudiate his own name? Would God repudiate the lamb that he gave for us all by allowing the Jews to climb up another way into the kingdom of heaven? This is contrary to the scriptures, yet it is believed by the vast majority of so-called Protestants today. He continues, he says, but though it is often claimed that he recovered, quote-unquote, the truth of the two stages of the secret rapture concept of the second advent of Christ, the hard fact is that he borrowed these from the Roman Catholic Jesuit priest Francisco Rivera and Emmanuel Lacunza and their eccentric disciple, 
Edward Irving. John Nelson Darby didn't have any revelation from the Lord. He simply picked up the Jesuit deception, and he promoted it in England and then through America, <clears throat> and then to America by Dr. C.I. Schofield. He says, John Nelson Darby was followed by Dr. C.I. Schofield, who compiled what is known in the world today as the Schofield Reference Bible. Dr. Schofield was born in 1843 and entered the legal profession. He was a lawyer and was a practicing lawyer at the time of his conversion to Christ in the 36th year of his age. Three years later, he abandoned his work as an attorney and was ordained by a congregational council. Some years later, with the assistance of an editorial board consisting of devoted Christian leaders, was produced the Schofield Reference Bible. It was first published in 1909 and revised in 1917, and again, more years recently. It is the Bible of the dispensationalists and has been criticized by those who labor in the churches as well as those on the oral teaching, uh, uh, excuse me, as well as those on the mission fields of the world as, quote, theories that are making the oral teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ of no effect and are blighting the Bible studies all over the world. Yes, indeed, the teachings of dispensational futurism contradict the very teachings of Jesus Christ, and they are stifling body, uh, Bible studies all over the world. And why are they stifling Bible studies? Well, simply this. Bible prophecy won't be fulfilled until the last seven years of time, and we're going to be raptured out, and we don't need to be concerned about it. So you walk into a church today, you begin to talk about the prophecies of Daniel, the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and the prophecies of John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, and they don't want to hear about it. If they do, they make token reference to it, but there's never a detailed study of it, because they don't want you to study the Scripture. They don't want you to study Bible prophecy because if you do, and if you get deeply into it, and if you are correctly guided by the Holy Spirit, what will be revealed to you is historicism, that the papacy has always fulfilled all the Bible prophecies regarding Antichrist. And this whole futurism is a Jesuit hoax. The study of Bible prophecy is left to those elite who wish to promote an, an alternative fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. A futurist hoax. And it's best that God's people remain ignorant of their plans. He says, <clears throat> Many are forced to leave prophecy alone for fear of confusing the dispensational applications. Perhaps the worst feature of dispensationalism is that it looks on all who, who don't hold its viewpoint as heretics or religious liberals or modernists who deny the Bible altogether. You see, futurism has indeed become orthodox. And the true teaching of the, of the Protestant Reformers, the true teachings of Christ and the Apostles, the true teaching of, of the John the Revelator, the true teaching of the Scriptures, and the true teaching of history is that the papacy is the Antichrist. And if you believe that, then you must be a heretic or a religious liberal or a modernist, and you must deny the Bible altogether. Now, I've seen this in my own personal life. After rejecting futurism, after coming to the knowledge of the Protestant truth, I'm no longer welcome in the modern-day churches today. They, they will hear nothing of historicism, that which all the Protestant reformers believed and taught. They are, they are bought hook, line, and sinker by this futurism, and why not? Because if they believe in this futurism, then they don't have to study Bible prophecy anymore. They're not accountable to the Scripture anymore. And they they have the psychological comfort in believing <clears throat> that Antichrist will never be a figure, in, a, a figure or an influence in their lives. 
and that all they have to do is lounge around and wait for the rapture when the Bible says, quite the contrary, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I can tell you, when you start teaching the truth, the historical truth about the papacy, you come under uniform, universal condemnation among Christians today. It says, godly ministers have been excommunicated from their denominations Devoted missionaries have been dropped from their mission boards, and Sunday school teachers of unquestionable orthodoxy have been dismissed simply because they have come to have revelations, or reservations, rather, about the scriptural soundness of the Darby Schofield innovations. In other words, they have doubts in dispensationalism and doubts in futurism. They're true Bible-believing Protestants. They denounce the papacy as the Antichrist, and they're not willing to accept the Jesuit lie. Therefore, they lose their jobs in all the churches. The surefire way of getting kicked out of a church today is to espouse what the Protestant reformers espoused. If you depart from dispensational futurism, Jesuit-authored dispensational futurism, You're no longer orthodox, but you're heterodox, a heretic, and you have renounced the Bible altogether. See how Satan can twist the scriptures and deceive God's people? Satan, through dispensational futurism, through the Jesuit-inspired and authored dispensational futurism, has rendered God's people an extreme minority in the world, a heavily persecuted people in the world, subject to all forms of tribulation in this world, and it's only going to get worse. He continues, he says, little wonder that Alexander Reese speaks of them as, quote, theories that are blighting Christian fellowship all over the world. Dispensational futurism destroyed any serious study of Bible prophecy and split the church between Protestants and, well, futurists. He says, Thus, Jesuit priest Ribera and Jesuit priest Ben Ezra have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams for the attention of thousands of Protestants who became deflected from the papacy deflected from their belief, their historical belief that the papacy fulfills all the Bible prophecies regarding Antichrist, and a future infidel Antichrist is looked for, and the historic Protestant view handed down by the Protestant reformers is despised by many, despised and persecuted. Now these are the hard facts of history. And a Protestantism saturated with Ribera's futurism and Schofield's dispensationalism is not the Protestantism of the Protestant reformers and has thus opened the door to Protestant Roman Catholic dialogue and the return, the ecumenical return of the Protestants to the Roman Catholic fold via the ecumenical movement and the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches, Vatican Council II, the ecumenical movement, is simply the paperwork signing off, signing off the completion of the destruction of Bible-believing Protestantism. We've seen it right before our very eyes, the death throw of Protestantism. It has been assailed by Jesuits who were sworn to destroy Protestantism, and they did it through dispensational futurism, John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield, and all the Protestant churches in America today. We must repent of dispensational futurism and return to Bible Protestantism. Now I've run out of time. We'll continue next Wednesday on Mystery Babylon. You've got another 14 minutes, Tom. Oh, 14 minutes. Okay, someday I'll get this down pat. All right. We're going into 15-minute overtime now. We'll continue. The ecumenical movement is a result of Vatican Council II. 
which was convened by Pope John the Twenty Third, Antichrist Pope John the Twenty Third, and it continued until nineteen sixty five and Pope Pius and <clears throat> excuse me, Pope Paul the Sixth. It was literally a surrender of Protestantism. Rome proposed to the Protestants that since you now believe in a future Antichrist, you cannot believe, you cannot hold to your Protestant belief that the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. Because you have believed these Jesuit priests, Rabira and Lacunza and Benezra, and you have believed Edward Irving, you believe the power court meetings, you believe the Brethren movement, you believed all these futurists and dispensationalists, what is there left to do but to conclude that the Protestant Reformation was a grievous assault upon the legitimate throne of God on earth, the papacy? And if that is what you believe, and you swear that that is what you believe after three generations of so-called Protestant churches proclaiming a future Antichrist, then there is but one there is but one rightful solution, and that is that you do, like the Irvingite Presbyterians, you reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. You repudiate your Protestantism. You accept your responsibility for overthrowing the temporal and spiritual power of the Vicar of Christ. And you must come home to the Roman Catholic Church and join with us in a common communion. You must celebrate with us the Mass and all the tenets and trappings of Roman Catholicism. And that's what they agreed to. Now, they didn't agree to change their name to Roman Catholics. Okay? They want to be remarried to the Roman Catholic Church, but they want to keep their Protestant maiden names. They still call themselves Presbyterians. They still call themselves Baptists. They still call themselves Lutherans, but they are all Catholic in their belief. They've exonerated the papacy. They believe in this future man-made Antichrist, rather Jesuit-made Antichrist, and they've repudiated the Protestant Reformation. And now together compose a gigantic religio-political entity, not only in the United States of America, but around the world. This interreligious dialogue was designed by the Jesuits to be the excuse to impose once again Roman Catholic papal tyranny, the spiritual and temporal power of the Pope. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the world today. Our Protestant rights are being destroyed and taken away from us. No more religious freedom, no more freedom of speech, no more freedom of conscience, and the most evident of all, no more freedom of the press. I mean, after all, we can't allow anything to be said in the mainstream or the alternative media that might waken the Protestants to this Jesuit lie. We must not do anything to jeopardize what came out of Vatican Council II, an ecumenical signed under the table agreement between the once Protestant churches to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church and accept the papacy and all the trappings of Roman Catholicism as the true faith of Jesus Christ. And so the press is gagged. And it's only up to one here and one there. Other people like Tom Press, other people like Inquisition Update, other people like Walt Stickle and his Mystery Babylon News Radio that will dare to tell the truth to Protestants and to plead with you to reject futurism, reject Jesuitism, Reject ecumenism and return to true Bible-believing Protestantism. Return to historicism. Return to that belief which was held by nearly every Christian prior to the, the, the Jesuit creation of futurism no more than three or four generations ago. 
if we do not return to the true belief of the Protestant Reformation, our country and our Protestant way of life will be destroyed. And Protestantism, true Bible-believing Protestantism, will be regarded as religious extremists, extreme fundamentalists, domestic terrorists, or any other label that they can hang upon our heads to criminalize us. And then history will repeat itself once again, and the true Bible-believing Christians, the followers of Jesus Christ and Him alone, those who would never bend the knee to the papacy, will once again be persecuted. And the history of the pagan Roman Empire throwing God's people to the lions and the history of the Holy Roman Empire running inquisitions and crusades against those who would never participate in the Mass, who would never accept the authority, either spiritual or temporal, of the Antichrist of Rome, will once again be persecuted beyond comprehension. And when they kill us, they will think they are doing God's service. Do you see how the Jesuits have made good on their oath to destroy Protestantism? It's all been done through the ecumenical movement and the World Council of Churches, and also through the 501c3 tax-exempt status for churches today. They have literally been made agents of the state, not agents of the church. And now the state regulates what the pastors can teach from the pulpits. And I guarantee you, if a man of God stands up and proclaims the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, if he's not thrown out by his own congregation, the state will find a reason to put him in prison. The state now serves the church. Church and state have been reunited as it was during the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, when the Pope ruled supreme over the governments of the world. And the governments of the world served the papacy, and they imposed Roman Catholic canon law upon the people. The people were held ignorant of Scripture. They were not allowed to read the Scriptures. They were not allowed to see in Scripture or history that the papacy fulfills every Bible prophecy regarding Antichrist. And they were simply forced by coercion, by every means, by torture, by execution, by every means, to worship the Pope of Rome and to obey his commandments, his laws, and participate in the abomination known as the Mass. Those days are returning right here to Protestant USA because we forgot the Protestant teaching. We forgot our Protestant heritage, and it's time for us to restore it before it's too late. And it is already too late to save this country, in my opinion. In my well-studied opinion, this country is going to be judged for its ecumenical movement. And God is hoping to restore a remnant of this country, just a remnant, to carry on the truth once the dust is cleared from the destruction of what was once known as Protestant USA. That's the cost of mixing the holy with the profane. That's the cost of mixing futurism with Protestantism the destruction of Protestantism. Now, the, the book continues. It says, the true Protestant churches to this very day are not dispensational futurists in their theological makeup. But few will use the book of Revelation as did the famous Protestant reformers. What a great loss to our cause. The Christian scholar Dr. H. Grattan Guinness in 1880 said, quote, the futurist interpretation of the book of Revelation is Roman Catholic and unscriptural, unquote. Another Protestant futurist teacher and a doctor of divinity at that admitted that the futurist dispensational school of Bible prophecy was indeed founded by Roman Catholic Jesuits, but then he turned around and says, quote, that's not to say it isn't un that it is unscriptural. Unquote. So, what next? Then, so are the Mass and Purgatory scriptural? How unthinkable. Now, a Welsh Baptist evangelist by the name of Reverend J.G. Morgan said, Futurism 
is of the darkness of hell itself. Dr. Howard Taylor, son of J. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, said, quote, how any Protestant preacher can believe the Roman Catholic-inspired scheme of revelation passes all comprehension, unquote. Dispensational futurism is a colossal fraud and is still confusing Protestants and sheltering the papacy. Our Lord Jesus Christ said not one word about rapturing the church away in secret seven years before his appearance or of his, sec- or of his returning the second time to give the world a second chance when all will be converted. That's not what the Bible tells us. There's no other form of salvation for the Jews than the one that God gave them on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ the Messiah. There is indeed no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. No animal sacrifice has any application whatsoever with God. To sacrifice animals again is a repudiation of Jesus Christ, just as it was 2,000 years ago, and yet the Jews, while after once rejecting Jesus Christ, continued to make animal sacrifices, and God called them an abomination. And that's what they'll be today. If they build a temple with hands in Jerusalem, God won't be in it. If they have, if they sacrifice animals and offer blood in this sanctuary, there'll be no Shekinah glory standing over it. The glory has left the building. He now dwells in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's not replacement theology. That's the truth. Now, he did say, quote, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work, unquote. This world tells us that his second advent is in judgment, for he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Our Lord never promised any future glory for this world, but only a fiery bath of destruction when all will be destroyed in readiness for the new heavens and the new earth. See 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. All Christless doctrines are false, no matter how many good men and eminent Bible teachers endorse them. The Canadian ICCC defender of the faith, Dr. T.T. T. Shield, said, quote, The futurist dispensational doctrines are figments of the imagination. I class them as heresy, he said. Christ is not coming the second time to give the unsaved a second chance in a second era of mercy for mankind. When Jesus Christ returns, the day of judgment comes and time ends. See Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 through 43, Romans chapter 8, verse 20 through 26, chapter 9, verse 28, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 through 16, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. Most of the Protestant reformers, with Calvin, Augustine, the Puritans, Whitefield, Spurgeon, Warford, Matthew Henry, all are in the company of renowned Christian men who utterly repudiated the false theory of an earthly Jewish kingdom. It was considered that Augustine was the most gifted theologian since apostolic days. In his book, The City of God, he so laid the Jewish kingdom ghost that it did not raise its head for hundreds of years and was not revived until Jesuit Ribera. We, we, we got this to about this, 15 seconds. And this is what unites Jews, Catholics, and evangelicals today over a dispute in Israel in an attempt to refulfill the 70th week of Daniel. And we'll talk more in detail next time. Thanks for listening.
Okay, you there, Tom?